Um, Miss Maxwell, um, I know you were born in Ackworth uh, uh, in, uh, a long time ago, <laughs> in 1930. 1930. Why don't you begin uh, by talking about uh, your parents? I, I know your father worked for the city for a long time. And, uh, why don't you talk about that? Well, my, my parents came here from Dawson County, from up, up around uh, they lived in Cumming just before they came to Ackworth in 1911. And my father still worked in Nelson, Georgia, so he would ride the train down to Elizabeth and then catch a train to go up to Nelson. And then later he worked in what was called the Marietta, well, later became the Marietta Transfer Company, and where they stored bales of cotton when we had the cotton gin here. And then, in 1914, he went to work for the city of Ackworth as superintendent of the water, lights, and streets, and uh, worked until 1958, and uh, until months before he died. So, uh, What do you remember about um, street lights in, <clears throat> in this area when you were growing up? Uh, 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 was it just downtown that you had? Mostly, life? mostly downtown. And then just every so often, like down Dallas Street, there would be a pole with a street light on it, but not not like it is today. It was just very sparse. and um, uh, But mostly downtown. We had one traffic light in town, and it was at the end of Dallas Street where it went uh, connected with Main Street and then went up across the railroad track and uh, Daly Street was uh, dirt until 1947 they paved Daly Street but the Main Street through Ackworth my mother told me that US 41 through Ackworth was a dirt street till about 1927-28 when they paved the street through town what about water? Did you have um, uh, indoor plumbing all the time that you were growing up? We did. We just had a sink with a spigot, we called it, in it. And then we had a sink in the base. I mean, a spigot in the basement where my mother had tubs and we washed, she washed clothes and had a pot outside the door that uh, she would keep fire under it where we had to put the clothes in before she rinsed them and she'd boil them a while. So everybody in you know, within the city limits had, had water? Had water because my daddy built uh, about five wells in Ackworth and he also put in uh, up on what we call Mitchell Hill, he put a, a reservoir and then the electricity was up there the where it came into town. It was all up there and then went out to the customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, most everybody had, uh, well, just, you know, uh, spigots and sinks. And uh, I, some people had washing machines that, uh, and uh, like our first refrigerator was an old one from Mr. and Ms. Carnes, and it had the motor on top. and. Otherwise, we had an ice box because we had an ice and coal company here where we got the ice from. Where was the ice and coal company? It was up on Main Street. Uh, it was across where the Legion Theater was, across the street, right at the railroad track, because the trains would come by and stop and dump the coal for uh, the coal, you know, that they sold. And uh, they all they had the ice and coal together. Um, I know. Uh, I guess when you were growing up, Ackworth had just a little bit over a thousand people. When in the city limits. Well, when I went to work at the post office, June the first, nineteen forty-eight, we had five hundred people in the city limits. And at the post office, we had two rural routes, a big general delivery where people call for their mail, and a small box section. But um, we had uh, 
then after World War II, and of course during the war, people worked at Bell Bomber, and then when Lockheed uh, started in about 51, then people moved in. They came from the neighboring states and moved here to go to work at Lockheed. So the town grew. Um, talk about the post office and your work there. Uh, where was the post office? The post office was when I went to work and it had been there since I remembered, was at the corner of Lemon Street and Main Street. And then about 1951, we moved down the street uh, in a building owned by Mr. Nichols that was next to Sam Pepper's Furniture Store. And uh, then about 1952, we had our first mail delivery, City Route. And um, then I think after Ms. McClure retired, uh, then Mr. Callahan became postmaster, and they moved it up on Lemon Street until the new building was built on Main Street, and that is a building owned by the federal government. Now, you were talking about uh, mail delivery. Um, uh, how did that work, uh, if, uh, in particular for people out in the countryside? Well, uh, their mail was delivered by name and route number. And the cases that the carrier had had names on them, not numbers. Nothing in the county was numbered, not even in the city of Ackworth. So then you just uh, sent it to a, a name? And a name. didn't even have a street name with it? Well, it, not for the rural routes, but uh, like for the city, it was a name in like Dallas Street or Lombardi or something. But no numbers. But no numbers. Mm. And, um, but before I worked, all my high school years, I worked in the drug stores. I want to ask you about that. Um, uh, uh, is, has Lacey Drugs always been in the same location? No. Um, it was Durham Drugs when I was born. Mm. And in the 40s, then Dr. Lacey came from Fairmount and bought Durham brothers and uh, it became Lacey Drug and it was on Main Street. Uh, there's a bridal boutique in the building now, but it was on Main Street on the south south of the south of Dallas Street. So did you go to work um, uh well you I guess you went to work at the post office right after you graduated from mm -hmm. high school? But you were working at Lacey Drugs um, much earlier than that. Yes, I went to work at the Ackworth Pharmacy when I was 12, before the summer before I was 13. So I worked all through high school, but I worked a little over two years at the pharmacy. And then I quit that summer to go to my sister's and uh, to help her for the summer. And when I came back, Dr. James said my position was filled, so I walked up the street and asked, told Dr. Lacey that I was uh, needing a job, so did he, he need help? And he said, by the way, I do. Can you come to work in the morning? So I worked at Lacey's then two years until uh, the afternoon I worked at Lacey's, graduated from high school, and went to work at the post office the next morning. Were there no child labor laws? or how Not then, and I had a Social Security card when I was 13. I still have my W-2, where I worked half a year at the pharmacy and half a year at Lacey's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know my wife worked at Dunaway's when she was 14 mm -hmm. years old, and uh, uh, I think they, well, they say they didn't know she was that young. <laughs> <laughs> well... During the war, Second World War, I guess you'd say that who didn't go in the service, that everybody worked at Bell Bomber. So there were young people and older people working the stores. Uh, and you were talking about the, the growth in the area because Bell Bomber came in? Well, uh, some because uh, most everybody would travel you know, to Bell Bomber, 
the surrounding areas. But then after the war, then Ackworth seemed to start growing, but mostly after Lockheed came. Then people from the neighboring states came to work for Lockheed and moved in. And of course, um, um, did, um, you worked at, how long did you work at the post office? 30 years. 30 years. I quit after 10 years. I worked up until the day before my son was born. So then I quit until after my daughter, who came five years later, was three years old, and I went back to work in 1966. Wow. And I was going to work 30 days, and that lasted 20 years. Mm. Wow. Well, how did the post office change over those 30 years? Oh, well, it, it really grew because, um, like I say, we had a small box section, and people would come in and call for their mail and uh, then come to the post office to get their mail from the box. And then when uh, we got the first city delivery, we delivered the whole town in a day, the whole city in a day, and we delivered the business section twice because we had mail coming in at 10 o'clock. But um, Mr. Abbott uh, transferred here to be the main carrier, and Ms. McClure asked me if I would be his sub, so I started being his sub about 1952, and I enjoyed it. What, what exactly did you do at the, in the post office? Well, uh, whatever needed to be done, then I, like I say, I subbed on the route, and when I went back, I subbed on all three city routes. And I was a clerk, and after 14 years, I went regular, so I was just a clerk. And I uh, divided the mail for the carriers and the box sections, and uh, just was a clerk at the window. When did you marry Hollis? Uh, 1950, February the 11th, 1950. Okay. So, uh, you, uh, and you continued to work at the post office yes. after that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, I guess you were about 20 years old at that time? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, so you just take um, a leave for a while when you had a child? Is that no, I, when uh, I was married for seven years before Mark was born, so I quit. I thought I was going to be a housewife and a mother. And then um, it just happened that I, in 66, that I just talked to the postmaster one morning and a person had passed away that was in the post office. And I said, well, if I can help you, let me know. And he called me that afternoon and said, can you work for 30 days? So okay. that was it. So you worked for 30 days? and then worked for 20 first, years. <laughs> and 20 more years. That's, that's great. Um, what, what did Hollis do? For he uh, was working at General Motors when we married, and then he was in the Army in World War II, so he joined the Navy during the Korean War, and after he came home, uh, we had been married three years, I guess, when he came home from the Navy. Uh, still wasn't out, but he was home. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went to work for Lockheed, <clears throat> he went back to General Motors and then decided Lockheed was closer, so he worked there for 30 years. Wow. What, what did he do at Lockheed? Well, he went in as a jig and fixture builder mm -hmm. and ended up as the manager in the machine shop. Hmm. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the businesses around town? Like there were several, a couple of lumber yards. And... There was... Um, Mills Lumber Yard first when uh, I was growing up, and there was a lumber yard up by the Ice and Coal Company, and then uh, I won't say maybe 34, 35, somewhere in there, it burned. I'm not sure about the year that the lumber yard burned that was on the main street in town, and um, then 
Mills opened a lumber yard on the south side of town, on the other side of the railroad tracks, and then Ackworth Lumber Yards, and then Mr. Hogg came, and he was the last one that had the lumber yard there in the 40s and uh, early, early 50s before he went out of business. Uh, I guess they did a lot of business with an area growing. I imagine so. Sure. I'm sure they did, and then later we had a business in town that was called Atme Lumber Company where they sold lumber and building materials and, uh, you know, different things for the home. Oh, so the, uh, like, Hog Lumber Company, um, you know, they were, they were not selling to no. residences? No, they weren't selling to residents. Who did they sell to? I'm not sure that, I'm. they just... Maybe they were selling to contractors that, you know, around the county. I'm not sure. Uh, talk about the cotton mills that were here, uh, Coates and Clark. Did you? Well, it was started by Esther Seal and her sister, Helen Mason, and it was called Ackworth Mills, and they made thread. And then later, I'm not sure if it was the late 50s or early 60s, I guess the late fifties they sold to Coates and Clark, and uh, did you uh, know any of the mill workers? Yeah, uh, yes, I did, and I knew all of them coming to the post office and to the drugstore, and uh, and yes, I knew the people that lived down there, and because they had built uh, row houses on Tacoa Drive for the. Uh, people that worked at the mill. In fact, they had their school, Eli Whitney School, for the peop children of the people that worked at the mill. So the mill uh, children never went to Ackworth? Well, they anything? did later, you know, because it was more, I won't say grammar school, but it was uh, a one-room schoolhouse. And then later they would transfer to the Ackworth School. Later, you mean uh, to, to go to high school? Um, I'm sure. Okay. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know how many grades it had. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of ladies that taught down there, but I don't know how many grades it had mm -hmm. until it finally closed and all of them came to Acquer School. Um, uh, what about Unique? Um, Unique was built in the 1920s. And when Mr. Kennel came and, and talked with the city and talked with my father, then uh, Daddy ran the power and the water up there for them to build the mill and have it there because they had to have both for their dye house and for their mill. They had to have the electricity and water. Yeah, I understand that the city of Ackworth went all out to recruit they, uh, Fred Keenel to... They uh, did. So that would make sense that they would provide him with the water and mm -hmm. the power that he needed. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that there was a, a, a strong class difference between mill workers and other people, or did they... Yeah, other people in town, or did they just um, blend in? Well, they... Uh, well, there was both, I guess, and they had their own grocery store. They called it the company store. Mm -hmm. Mr. Paul McClure was the manager of that, and they could go there and get their groceries and things, and and I'm sure charge them what I understand and then pay for them when they got their checks at the end of the week. But uh, there was uh, just a slight, you know, I mean, that was one thing, and then... Uh, but then they, the children, then after they came to the Aqua School, then they, they almost started blending in. Then we all, you know, just blended together. What about um, race in Ackworth? Um, you know, there was a, always a, a significant black community in Ackworth. And you were telling me earlier about uh, your long-time association with Evelyn Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk about... Um, uh, maybe how separate things were, and how and how much uh, uh, whites and blacks mingled together in that. Work. Well, it uh, it was a, there was a difference because 
well, myself, and I called it Colored Town. And across the railroad track, and the whites lived over here, but there were three families of blacks that lived here on Mill Street right behind my house, and they used to keep me if mother needed any help, you know, or or any of the kids, because there was eight of us, then they would help mother. But uh, the blacks had their own school, and it was first the Rosenthal School that was over there, and then the city moved it, made a community house, and built a brick school for the blacks. But it went for the grammar school, and if they went to high school, they had to go to Marietta. They had to ride the bus, uh, the Greyhound bus, to go to Marietta to school if they went to high school. Well, where was the bus station? Well, at first it was in the Lacey Drug Company. And uh, when I worked there, we just had a little booth over by the door where people came, bought their tickets, and the bus stopped outside the door, you know, on the street. And uh, then in later, the bus station was built down at the corner of Maple Drive and Main Street in the late, in the 40s, I guess. Um, by the way, uh, when, uh, we're, when we were talking about uh, the drugstores earlier, I, I failed to ask, did you, did you have a soda fountain inside? We the did drugstore? at both drugstores and at the pharmacy, uh, because Dr. James came from Atlanta and opened the pharmacy in the 30s, he had what was called a malted milk machine where we made soft-serve malted milk. And I know I would run from school to replenish the malted milk machine uh, for the kids that came from school to get the cones. And then we had people that lived in Dalton and as far away as Chattanooga that would stop on their way home from Bell Bomber because they wanted the malted milk. And uh, since the main street through Ackworth was US 41, at both drugstores that I worked at, um, tourists would stop to get something to drink or something to, we served hot dogs at the pharmacy and sandwiches, and then we had things, sandwiches and things and milkshakes at both drugstores. So tourists would stop and uh, to get things. I've heard stories from Bill Dunaway about uh, 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 in the age of segregation, blacks would come in, but they'd stand at the end of the counter to mm -hmm. be served. Was it the same way in Ackworth? It was, and they couldn't stay in the store to get drink their drinks. And at the pharmacy, when I worked there, we had to serve their Coca-Colas in paper cups because they had to go outside to drink them. They couldn't stay in the building. Um, did you have a, a Coke machine where you bought the syrup and mixed it up yourself, or, or did you buy Cokes like they are today? No, we had the, the, the big machine that was a big thing right at the fountain, and the carbonated water came in with the Coke. And we'd just pull down the thing, we'd get a little ice and put in the cup, and then put the cup under where the dispenser was, and it would the carbonated water and the coke would come out. And all along the, the where we worked behind the counter, there were pumps, containers with pumps in them that had syrup, cherry syrup and different syrups that we would put on Sundays and banana splits. And people wanted a cherry coke, we'd put the coke and we'd pump a little bit of the cherry in the coke. So each one was a little unique, I mm -hmm. guess, in the way that you mixed them. Mm -hmm. What were some of your favorite stores in, in downtown Ackworth? Oh, well, I guess Allen's Five and Ten Cent Store was one of them, and the drug stores, and then I started out with Clark's Shoe Store, where my daddy bought my shoes, was on the corner of Daly Street and Main Street, and then... Uh, the silver trolley where we could go and get a hot dog if we had a nickel. And then uh, Mr. G had a 
cafe on up at the south end of the street uh, before you got to Lacey Drugs. And uh, uh, Ms. Neal had a cafe that were stores across Main Street that backed up to the railroad track. Uh, but Ms. Neal had a cafe over there, and Ms. Jolly had a, a beauty parlor, and the barber shop was over there, and uh, then the Presleys had an auto and home place, and we visited all of those. But growing up, we played in the cotton gin down where they'd put the cotton seeds and things. Yeah, where, where was the cotton gin? Back of this building, down this was an alleyway, and right back of this building was a mew barn, and all the stores on Main Street backed up to this alleyway that came down, and uh, the Macmillans had a store, and then in later, later years, Harrison's had a grocery store facing Dallas Street, and then uh, you went down the alleyway, and there was the mew barn, and then the cotton gin, and on the other side, if you went up the street on the south, of way to the south, there was, um, it was a feed store first where the tavern is, and then it was a hardware. And Dr. Bailey owned where I live, he owned all the way up to Senator Russell Square. And then he saw in the late 20s, he sold that part off to Mr. Nichols for the feed store. Then they had a blackness shop and the fire truck was in a little building, and the jail house, and then past that was the lodge hall at the corner of, um, well, we called it Center Street then, and Lemon Street. Was that a Masonic lodge? Mm-hmm, the Masonic Lodge, Ackworth Masonic Lodge. Um, uh, it was upstairs. Okay, the lodge was upstairs? In that big brick building, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was told there was something about a pony in the jail. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me that story? Well, all I know is, and we didn't call it a pony, it was a donkey. A donkey, okay. That's <laughs> what we thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> what we were told, that was put in the jail. And uh, I don't think they ever found out who put it in there, but they finally got it out. It was in one of the cells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember seeing those cells in that, mm -hmm. that old jail. Not a well, place that you'd want to stay in. Very no. Long, I don't think. And that was not the jail that was there when I was born. That jail was built after I was born. I oh, don't know right. how I old was I was. One of those government projects mm -hmm. in the Depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the WPA built it. I, I think it might have been. I, I, uh, uh, a few years ago, I could have told you, but right now I can't remember well, the story. But it sounds like it was something like WPA. Well, I know when I was growing up, six, five, and six, the WPA had a thing every summer over at the schoolhouse, and mostly in the old building that was there, the old brick building that was there before the uh, one that was built in thirty-five. Uh, they had two people there all summer for the children. We all went over there and played all day, and did crafts and played and played ball. And and uh, they had a, a gentleman that would take the young people a little older than me because I couldn't go. I wanted to, but he'd take them up on Mitchell Hill at night and tell ghost stories. And But he would mostly play ball with the boys and things. But the WPA furnished that for several years. Uh, tell me about the schools. Uh, or, or, uh, you mentioned the Eli Whitney School. Tell me about Ackworth Grammar School. Well, the Ackworth School that I went to was built about, uh, I get, may have been started in 34 and built in 35. I started in 36 in the first grade and we only had 11 grades. and. Uh, I know I have my one of my older sister's diploma, and there was only about seven or eight people that graduated, and and but that was before the new building I called it was built. But I went 
four grades in the new building and then from fifth, sixth, and seventh, I went in the old two-story building that was the Smith Lemon Institute. And uh, I did those three grades there and we had our plays and things in the auditorium upstairs in that building. And then I did the uh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh in the new building, we called it, that they've torn down and made the school now. But uh, that. Where was the Smith Lemon Institute? It was right next to where they built the new building, and it was a big two story building. And uh, I don't know when it was built. I've, I've always been told before the Civil War that it. And it had the lodge hall in it, and then the Methodist church was built over there by it because my granddaddy hauled the logs that and helped build the Methodist church that was there before they built the one on the, at the corner of Morningside and Main Street. Uh, talk about some of the teachers that you had. Oh, well... I started in the first grade with Miss Kate Good, and she taught over there 50 years. And uh, we only had a few people in class, uh, maybe 15 people, or, and after we got on up, maybe 20, but not, not very many people, you know, in each class. But then uh, after we would get to the 10th grade, then they, we were the only county school on this end of the county. And they bused people from all the way out on Johnson's Ferry Road to our school. But uh, we had uh, older teachers, and the teachers would uh, live in the homes with people, you know, to, was uh, Miss... Well, she later married Raymond Bailey and Miss Pickett and different ones that, and Miss Chapman and we really thought they were old, but they they really weren't that old. But we were so young, we thought they were. Mm -hmm. But Miss Kate taught over there for fifty years. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, can you think of any of the other teachers along the way? Did you know Mr. Sprayberry? Well, Miss Sprayberry was my fifth grade teacher. And Mr. Sprayberry was the uh, superintendent over there before he went to Marietta, to, before he became the county superintendent. And then Mr. Ramsey came after Mr. Sprayberry left. And then before Mr. Ramsey left, Mr. T.C. Cantrell, who was here a long time, came. And Miss Cantrell, Miss Cantrell taught me in the seventh grade and uh, was first year they came to Ackworth and uh, but Mr. Sprayberry uh, taught me well, I mean Miss Sprayberry taught me but Mr. Sprayberry was superintendent over there a long time before he went to Marietta. How long did Ackworth have its separate school? It wasn't part of the county system was it? For... Oh I don't know when it became the county but as long as I can remember it was the county but I know when I first went to school my daddy had to pay a dollar and it was called a poll tax but he paid a dollar every year for each of us to go to school mm -hmm. and all eight of us went to school over there. Do you think you got a pretty good education? Oh, I think so. I think so. I, uh, I, my older, one of my older sisters went to college and became a teacher before she had her business in the health food business in Atlanta. But uh, I think we we really got a good education. You were part of a pretty big family, weren't you? What? I'm the baby of eight. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, uh, there was five girls and three boys. And uh, my three brothers were all in the service. My granddaddy was in the service. He fought in the Civil War. My daddy was in the Marines, 1900, stationed in Cuba. And all three of my brothers were in the Navy. And then during the Korean War, my middle brother joined the Air Force. But, uh... That sounds like the, uh... But we, 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 in, we enjoyed each other and 
after we got grown, we had good times getting together. What would you do for fun while you were growing up? Oh, we played hide and seek, and we played with the neighbors, and it was safe, so we played at night, and uh, we skated, and uh, we'd skate out on US-41, and because uh, I, I had skated as far up north as the Clark Thread Company. They had uh, would put out, uh, you know, these, uh, what kind of thread am I trying to say? During the war and before the war, they had chenille bedspreads, and they would hang them out on lines in front of the house, and that's about mile and a half north on US 41, but that was Robert Clark's parents. How much traffic was there on the Dixie Highway in those days? Well, um, it was, uh, we thought it was a good bit, but it wasn't all that much because there'd be really lulls where there wouldn't be any traffic coming through. And like I say, we could get out there and skate or whatever. Not much traffic at night. I wouldn't think, I wouldn't no. think you would get out and skate on uh, Main N Street. Not in the today. daytime, but at night we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand there was a hotel in Ackworth? There was. Where was it? It was at the corner of Lemon Street and Main Street. And a beautiful hotel. And it had a big porch around the top and the bottom, and the veranda. And there was a tennis court across the street that was next to the railroad track. And then in later years, they moved the tennis court behind the hotel. But people, my mother told me that people would ride the train and come to Ackworth because uh, we had a mineral well down at the corner of what was called Park Street now and Main Street, but we called it Mineral Well Street back then. And uh, the bank built down there and Cobb Exchange. And then now it's a chiropractor people. But the mineral well was down there and people would come from everywhere to drink the mineral water, Mother told me, and stay at the hotel. And then later, school teachers lived at the hotel and then uh, I remember Judge and Ms. Autry lived there then in their last years. And, uh, how, how big was the hotel? Well, at the time, I thought it was big when I was growing up, but it was, um, uh, well, it was good size. It took up, uh, I'd say, that part of the block, and then the houses started after that, the McLean house and then the the Davenport house and Dr. Terry's house on on down the street. But uh, now people wouldn't think the hotel was that big, but it we thought it was big. And it, it was a beautiful place, really. Uh, I heard something about shooting out the red light. Well, that I don't remember. Okay. I've heard... I mean, people have talked about it, but I don't remember when it happened. But you weren't the one who shot it. No, I wasn't the one. Okay. Um, when you needed to go to a doctor, where, where did you go? Well, uh, walked up the street to Dr. Bailey's office, and uh, if we uh, went up there with anything as when we were children, he would give us, if we didn't cry, he would give us a nickel and a package of Ovaltine, so we got to where we would skin our knees, do anything to, to go to Dr. Bailey. And Dr. Bailey was my doctor when I was born, and he lived across the street in the house I live in now. And he and Miss Bailey didn't have any children, but they loved all the children in Ackworth. But uh, there was Dr. Bailey and Dr. Terry, Dr. Will Humphreys when I was growing up. And uh, so we, but we went to Dr. Bailey. And then when Dr. Bailey died, Dr. Davis came to town and then Dr. McCall. But then I went to Dr. Davis until Dr. McCall, Dr. Cobble came to town and then went to Dr. Cobble. 
what about uh, the dentist? Uh, were there uh, any dentists? In there was Airport? Dr. Reed, and his office was upstairs on Lemon Street in the two-story building where Dr. McCall later was downstairs and Dr. Reed was upstairs. And the building on the corner upstairs was the uh, telephone operator. And we used to go up there and sit and watch Miss Lena Whitten. She was the telephone operator because that was the kind of phones we had. We had an operator. And uh, on our street, we had about the only phone because Daddy had to have a phone. And the, all the neighbors would come to the house and borrow our phone. They'd call it to call somebody. Or if they got a call, we'd have to go to the neighbors and tell them to come. They had a call on the phone. <laughs> so if you wanted to make a call, you actually called the operator. Operator. Mm -hmm. And asked the operator mm -hmm. to connect you to... And our number was 49. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the 40s, we had the dial phone. We got the rotary phone mm -hmm. then. Uh, it may have been late 30s, but early 40s, then when we got the rotary phone. But I, I can remember going up and watching Miss Lena when she'd put those plugs in the wall, you know, in the thing, when people would make a call. And she'd say, number please. <laughs> Do you remember uh, when they uh, built the lake? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? When, in 1950, after we got married and we lived on Maple Drive, uh, then for six months we moved over on Adams Circle in the big two-story house, and they were started building uh, Lake Ackworth and built the little what we called the Little Dam. And I would go over and sit on the bank and watch them build the, on the little dam in the early 50s. But that was, uh, and then they built the beach and things. But I remember when they built the Altoona Dam. We were up having a picnic up there and they were, had just started rerouting the river with the Coffer Dam when we were up there on the Etiwal River on, on having a picnic. A lot of land got flooded then with mm -hmm. Alatoona mm -hmm. and, and Lake Ackworth as well. Yeah, but we were down, would have been down below the dam at the picnic where they had started the coffer dam to reroute the river until, you know, they built the dam. Did you go to the beach very often? Well, we did, and uh, we used to go down to the beach house, and they had rocking chairs all around the porch and we'd go at night and sit down there and rock and talk and visit with people and then later when my son was born we'd go down to play in the sand on the beach and then they had a little train down there and uh, a little train mm -hmm, I, i'm not sure if bobby kennel started it it was just a little train ran on tracks just went around and around but uh then Mr. Callahan had it for a while, and uh, the kids would get on and ride the train, and and we just there were a lot of things down there. Then later for children that you know, then they built the swings and slides and things later, and then and built the uh, places where you could sit and have a picnic. But first it was just the beach. Uh, do you remember Mary McCall? Was yes, she, I do. It's unusual to have a woman as mayor back in the 50s. She I was about the first one. and uh, But I remember, I, I remember when she was mayor, and then my husband was on council when she was mayor in 1963 and 64. But uh, I remember well, and I remember we could go up to the office and she'd give the shots and... And when I was bit by a rabid dog, uh, we'd go to their office to get a shot. And then on Sunday morning, we'd all, there was seven of us bit by the same dog, and we'd all meet over at uh, Dr. and Ms. McCall's house at a certain time on Sunday morning to get our shot. So I remember her very well. I can 
can you say anything? Uh, uh, what was her personality like? Well, she, um, what I want to say, uh, she was very outgrowing, outgoing, and it, we all... We all liked her. She was well liked by everybody, but boy, she could set you down if you needed sitting down. <laughs> she uh, she had her own language. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Well, she uh, she could talk and okay. she could she could let you know in a firm voice what she meant, and it um, sometimes might not be nice words. <laughs> um. Probably should have done this earlier in the interview, but I, when we were talking about um, uh, lights and water and so on, what about milk? Uh, did uh, did you have uh, milk delivered to your house, or did you buy it in the store? Well, first we bought it, and we, of course, we bought our milk first from down at Miss Burtz's house down the street, and then uh, we bought from Mister Terry's dairy, and uh, then it was delivered to the house. But and then after, uh, well, we had delivery. I guess in the early '60s, we still had a delivery that came in town, and because my delivery man was Ben Turner, who later I worked at the post office with, but he was the milkman. But uh, um, then we'd go to the store to buy the milk. But at first, we uh, either would buy it at the store up at Miss Tideaway's store, um, or uh, we bought it down, especially buttermilk from down at Miss Burtz's and butter down where, the street. Where did the milk come from? Was it well, Miss Burtz, they had cows down. You could have cows in town then, because we had cows when I grew up. But uh, So this is what we would call raw milk? Mm -hmm, yes. It, none of it was ever pasteurized. We drank raw milk, and I watched my mother churn and make butter when we had cows, and uh, so yeah, that was that was what we had when I grew up was raw milk. We didn't, and when it was pasteurized, we bought it at the store. We thought we couldn't drink it. <laughs> um, I think when you were growing up, uh, Cobb County was still dry. Um, it, is that true? Well, more or less. Now, I remember later they had what we call beer joints. They could go up above town, not in town, but up at Mr. Bish's, they could buy beer. and uh, But then they couldn't buy whiskey. And then later in years, people called it going to the river. They'd have to go to Fulton County to buy their uh, whiskey or anything, but they could still buy a little beer, you know. So, so the liquor stores were just across the Chattahoochee across the river. Chattahoochee River I for heard years. That mm -hmm. going Go to, to the, the river. river. <laughs> okay. Um, I understand there were. Was there a bowling alley in there? There was, and it was at one time. It was down next to Sam Pepper's Furniture Store. That Mr. Sam Pepper's Furniture Store used to be Butler's part of Butler's garage to where he sold cars and I think at one time Mr. Ed Fowler sold cars in there but Mr. Butler and then the garage part and the gas pumps were across the street uh, next to the railroad track but that was Butler's garage and then it became Sam Pepper's furniture but next to it they had a bowling alley at one time and then the bowling alley was up under what was called later Marietta Transfer and Storage Company, next to the depot, and then um, I'm not sure if it was across the street. I remember up there after the post office moved, seemed like there was a pool hall up there at one time. But uh, but yeah, we had bowling alleys, and then we had the pool hall and things like that here in town. Oh. Oh, oh, good, good, good thought. <laughs> yeah, you might want to re-ask that question. But if you want to, okay. yeah, if there was just a little too much happening. The train, train. Was going by, mm -hmm. probably picking that up. Yeah, I remember the trains, the steam engines that we had. 
Talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, I remember the first time I rode the train, I was three years old, and I went to the depot with Mother, and we went to Arkansas and back on the train. And then later, uh, we would ride the train into Atlanta. We could catch the train in the morning. Number, they called it number three, and in the morning and uh, go into Atlanta. And uh, but it, I remember the steam engines. And I guess it was my twelfth birthday. I was over at my friend Sonny's and the Martha Ann guest, uh, and we Martha Ann went on home across the street. She was a Methodist minister's daughter, and Sonny and I walked up. To, over to the railroad track and there was a steam engine sitting there and so we climbed up the bank and the engineer let us get on the engine showed us how to put the coal in we stayed about an hour and he showed us everything about the steam engine which was very exciting for me because I loved trains but um, I can remember the troop trains that came through they had the steam engines and uh, the trains would just be full of soldiers and people, you know, and they'd be waving out the window like that. And then the uh, the buses that would come through full of the soldiers and uh, go into different, you know, camps and things. And they always had little pieces of paper because we used to go up and sit on the bank at Mr. Collins' house and the soldiers would throw out little pieces of paper that had their name and address on it and wanting people to write to them, you know, while they were in camp or overseas or something. But very exciting to me was the trains. I loved the trains and, and the steam engines. And then we got the quick, uh, well, the non-steam engines, the ones we have now, and we had passenger trains come through until, I know we had them in the 60s, and uh, our mail came on the train, and we would make a bag, we called it a gizzard, that had a strap in the middle, and we'd hang it on a pole, and the train, the people in the mail car would... Have to stop just oh. for a second, we got another train coming. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> and they sit up there too. See how fast this one goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the we put the mail was carried by train, and it was carried. Uh, the mail, first class mail, was put in the bag that the uh, mail people on the mail car would reach out a pole and pick it up off the iron pole that was by the railroad track. And then the packages in the other mail was put over at the depot every afternoon late, and the train would stop then at 10 o'clock at night and pick up the mail and pass in, you know, the packages and things. And uh, But the first class mail would be put on. And then uh, if the, we didn't have a phone at the post office, so if the bank was going to get money on the train, the, one of the tellers would come to the post office and tell us that the train was going to slow up and he was going to put they were going to put off money so some of us would have to go over to the railroad track and meet the train and the train would slow up and drop off these bags of money and then we'd bring them to the post office and cover them with mail sacks and hide them until uh, the man knew to come from the bank to pick the money up but that's how they got money. They, we didn't have the armored trucks then. Was Ackworth a pretty safe place? In it days? was. It was real safe. It was growing up. Uh, it, we just could play. The people could leave their cars unlocked. We left our doors unlocked until in the 50s. We left our doors unlocked and the cars and windows up and everything. It was a safe place. Mm -hmm. And it was a a good place for children to grow up. I had the best childhood. I really did. Well, that's great. Uh, something that we uh, skipped earlier that um, I wanted to ask you about is where the old mill is. Uh, that's a restaurant nowadays. Gabriel's oh, Gabriel's restaurant. But um, I 
got an Elizabeth Bartley tape of tapestry. Tapestry mill, it was, and it was uh, my grandmother. Well, during the war, if she came into town to uh, do her corn, grind her corn, she had to get permission then to go over from the from the northern soldiers to go over and get her corn ground at that mill. And then uh, later it became the tapestry mill. And the tapestry mill was beside, you know, the big smokestack that was there. And I think when we had a small tornado in the 30s, I think is when it got a little damaged. But uh, I think Mr. Cowan is the one that built it. And that was way before my time, so I'm not sure when that was. But then the tapestry mill, and it was David Rothschild Company, and they were a European company that owned it. And uh, they made tapestry and shipped it all over the world from that mill. And my first knowledge of the mill was Miss Carlene Fowler was the manager of the mill. And then later, the person that worked under her, Rusty Bryant, became the manager of the mill until it went out of business. And I have a piece of tapestry. In fact, Rusty made uh, my first piece of tapestry I had on the wall in a place that used to be a window was three chair bottoms that wasn't cut apart and he made it special. He said, your daddy helped us anytime the power went out. He was always here to get the power started to uh, so that the machines could get back running and so he wouldn't let me pay for that. And then later I have another piece of tapestry that I have up there now that was made in that mill down there. Well, you make um, old Ackworth sound very appealing. It was. Uh, what do you think of Ackworth today? Well, Ackworth has become uh, a really get-going city, I guess you'd say, or metropolis, or but they've really done and built the town up and it really looks good. And uh, the, the things that have come to Ackworth that we don't even have to hardly go to the mall now. We've got everything right here that we didn't ever have. And uh, it's just, it's become a, a, a beautiful city. They've made it a beautiful city and uh, just have done uh, the things they've done in the stores on Main Street, the gift shops and the restaurants, they've, they've really, uh, you know, built things up and made it really a, a place that people really want to come to and visit. The bookstore, he has everything in the bookstore. And people come and, and uh, they come to the things they have here, like the art fest they just had, and then they'll see the stores and things and they'll come back. Because I know there have been people from... 40 and 50 miles away that come to Henry's just to eat. So, and they line up on the weekends up there. Well, Miss Maxwell, I'm out of questions. Is there anything, uh, while, the, while we've still got the tape running, anything else that you would like to add to this interview? Well, I know growing up that the children, we all played together, and we could play, and all the mothers were mothers to all of us. If we were up the street and were misbehaving or anything, that mother up there corrected us, and we minded <laughs> that mother, and we knew it better. But growing up and then during the war and uh, how things changed and how things changed after World War II, that seemed to really start things to, you know, a change in people and things being different. And uh, from then on, things just weren't the same. It was growing. But when I was growing up, it was one of the 
best towns I could have ever lived in, I think.